Open your Bibles, please, to Matthew, and open your hearts. A lot of people open their Bibles and close their minds. But uh, we're going to look at the Gospel of Matthew this morning. And uh, I'd like to declare, it's a boy! It's a boy! You know, in this confusing, whacked-out, crazy world, are they still doing gender reveal parties? Wow. Now they're doing it when the child is 10. Yeah, because the world's nuts. Here we have one of the greatest gender reveals in the history of mankind. Matthew, who is Jewish, oftentimes referred to as Levi, is a tax collector. And as a tax collector, he had to be articulate in his language. And I suspect, because I know bookkeepers, number crunchers, he is very organized. And the thing I love about Matthew's gospel specifically, and some scholars say it may have been the first written, may or may not have been, but he went to great lengths by the Holy Ghost to pen words like, this was done to fulfill the scriptures. So Matthew, who went into the Holy Scriptures and saw the prophetic scriptures written over centuries upon centuries. And upon that, then he looked at hundreds of scriptures, and he saw one man, one, that these prophetic scriptures were all fulfilled in, that man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Messiah. Oh, boom shakalaka. Oh, suki suki. Are you with me? Say, I can dig it. Okay. Now, Spurgeon said something like this. He said, the mystery of Christ incarnation. What is incarnation? I used to put carnation milk in water and put it on my cereal. That is not what we're talking about. Say, I can dig it. All right. So the mystery of Christ incarnation. What is the incarnation? It is the declaration of Holy Scripture that God would become man. Wow. Wow. That Jesus was 100% man, 100% God, no sin nature, and no sin. And ultimately, the perfect Lamb of God who died for the sins of the world. Say, praise God. Ooh, that is so good. Spurgeon says, the mystery of Christ's incarnation is to be adored but not pried into. If we know not the way of the spirit of the formation of the common persons, nor how the bones are formed in the womb of anyone that is with child, much less do we know how the blessed Jesus was formed in the womb of the blessed virgin. You know what? I just declared to you some of the most prolific and powerful truth found in Scripture. That is deep. See, because one of the great struggles in our society for many decades has been when does life begin scriptures clearly make it clear does life begin at conception does life begin at a heartbeat or is it life and a person a living being moments before birth or moments after birth or at any time during the period of forming of that person in the womb when does life begin you know we as People sure do make things hard. Hi, I'm Perry Black right here at Second Chance Youth Ranch TV on Victory Television Network. And I'd like to invite you personally to join us every Thursday night at 11 p.m. as we look at the need for fostering, adoption, and mentoring. And what a great opportunity you have to join us every Thursday night at 11 p.m. right here on Victory Television Network, and I look forward to seeing you. Oh, you who feel self-condemned and unworthy sometimes because you don't have a revelation of who God says you are. Yeah, you. You who feel insignificant. God, why would God do that for me? Who am I? I'll tell you who you are. If you're born again, you're a child of the living God, bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. That's who you are. And His thoughts towards you are precious, and they are countless. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. This is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother, Mary. Everybody say Mary. <laughs> Y'all are funny. Mary was engaged to, her, uh, to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin. Everybody say virgin. We're not talking about Madonna. 
who feels like a virgin. We're talking about Mary who is a virgin, which means she has never been sexually intimate with a man. Look at the person beside you and say, wow. While she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, sell that. I want you to think about the Jerusalem Post, the conservative paper of the day, and the Jerusalem Times, the liberal paper of that day. In the conservative paper, they say, hey, we have great news. A virgin has conceived of the Holy Ghost, the Christ child, the Messiah, who's going to give his life for the sins of the world. Wow, what a headline. Great headline. The Jerusalem Times, New York Times, Jerusalem Times, the liberal paper, something insane and false information and disinformation is being propagated that a virgin, parentheses, quotation marks, squiggly fingers, they like those, impossible, is pregnant of the Holy Ghost, and they are declaring him to be the Savior of the world. Impossibility. The FBI talks to them, and they remove it from Twitter. Uh Uh-oh, went too relevant for the season, did I? Do you realize what I just read to you? That you just, you know, I'm a Christian. For sure. Yeah, I have my own time. Yeah, uh uh-huh, yeah. Virgin, conceived of the Holy Ghost. Going to have a baby. Well, let's read the story. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man, didn't want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break up the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Oh, gosh, it gets crazier. Joseph, a good man who was raised knowing the prophetic scriptures that Messiah was coming and how he's going to get here, has just found out the young lady he's engaged to is telling him she's pregnant and not pregnant by him. That's got to be a shocker. That's got to be gut-wrenching. When I was in high school, back with Fred Flintstone and Barney, and Dino, If a young lady was pregnant back in those days, she might move away to another city or another state and live with grandma. I was at a internationally known Bible training center in Oklahoma talking to the youth pastor where I was going to speak, who is now a pastor in Colorado Springs doing a wonderful work there. His name is Dean. And a little... 15 year old girl walked up with her infant and said hey brother Dean you want to see my baby he said sweetie that is the cutest little baby but this is the youth department you need to take your baby to the nursery she didn't seem to be embarrassed or shocked but thank God she had the baby we're living in a different generation but in in the days of Joseph and Mary if a young lady out of wedlock were to be pregnant, she could be stoned. So this is serious. And here Joseph, a man of reputation, a good man, the Bible says, finds out the young lady he's married to uh, has informed him she's pregnant and she ain't been with a man. And he's like, does she think I'm stupid? Does she expect me to believe that? But he cares about her. So I want you to think about the internal struggle he's having. Well, what about the struggle of Mary? She's a good girl. She's a virgin. So being a good man, he thinks he'll just put her away privately, not do anything publicly. I don't know if he's thinking about his reputation or hers, but he's contemplating, what should I do? This is heavy stuff. I know some of you are quiet because maybe you've been where Mary is with a baby and not with a husband. See, in the 1970s, over 40% of our children in our homes in America had a father and a mother, and they were married, living in the same household. Now it's around 17%. wonder what's going on in our world, where the libraries let us have drag queen story time with children, but Kurt Cameron can't read something based in values and faith. 
It's a crazy world. Well, Joseph is engaged to a young lady named Mary, and she's pregnant, and he's contemplating this. Wouldn't you be? In our generation, maybe a Mary, someone who's pregnant out of wedlock, is thinking, whew, boy, how am I going to finish high school? How am I going to, how am I going to provide? How is this going to disrupt my college education and the dream of my profession and my career? This is not a puppy that six weeks old, I can go down to the department store parking lot with a little cage on the back of the truck and say, free babies. Can I tell you, that's why we're, we're finishing a pregnancy crisis center for girls. Because we not only care about babies, we care about teenage girls that are in the struggle and the decisions and maybe the humiliation. And they're going to be sitting in church. They're going to be hearing gospel messages of Jesus and his grace. The kind of messages of grace that you and I heard that caused us to come to Jesus and make him Savior. We serve a good God. Well, Joseph is contemplating. I'm sure he's thinking, man, this is a bummer. I don't know, being Hebrew, he probably didn't think it's a bummer. So he thought, I'll just put her away privately. And then an angel of the Lord shows up. Oh, man, that's cool. I'd like to have an angel visit me, but not in that situation. Laying on my back in the hospital room, I show like an angel to show up. Struggling to pay my bills, I'd like an angel to show up and say, hey, check it out. God's got this. An angel shows up, says, Joseph, this which is in Mary's womb is conceived of the Holy Ghost. It's going to be okay. She's going to have a son, gender reveal. That's got to be thrilling for a, a dad. And you, Joseph, are going to name him Jesus. And he'll save his people from their sins. Wait a minute. Pregnant virgin. A betrothed husband struggling with the decision of what to do and not marry her, but to go ahead and privately divorce her. And now I find out I'm going to be a father of a son, and this son conceived in the eyes of the world, because even the Jewish leaders at one time attacked Jesus and said, we're not born of fornication. We weren't conceived in sin. That's the accusation. And he's going to save the world his people, of their sins. Whew. That is awesome. Pretty cool. See, because when Jesus comes, he not only comes to deliver us through his saving grace from the power of sin and the presence of sin and the penalty of sin, he actually comes to save us from our very sin nature by being born again. We are now born again of God's divine nature through these great and precious promises. Wow. That's why Jesus is coming. So now Joseph hears what the angel says. In verse 24, this is powerful. Is verse 24 on the screens? Joseph is woke. <laughs> glory. I said glory. Joseph is woke. And when he woke up, he did. He didn't just hear. He didn't just agree. He didn't just have mental assent. He did what the Lord commanded. Amen. 1972, laying in that cell ministry. In Mainz, Germany, this young man who denied the existence of God Almighty, and therefore this Christmas story irrelevant in my life, woke up, the lights came on. And on November 14th, days later, I walked out a free man, woke, alive, awake, 
to the things of God. And for the last 50 years, I've been doing what the Lord commanded. And that's what I'm doing today. And that's why I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Church, wake up! God is alive. This is not some blind faith. This is based in the reality of prophetic scriptures, hundreds of them fulfilled in one person. And if Jesus does not fulfill every one of the prophetic verses, he cannot be Messiah. And if he is not born of a virgin conceived of the Holy Ghost, no matter his intention, he cannot be Messiah. If you're willing To pursue the purpose of God in your life. God's dream and purpose will fulfill your life. And you can be anything that you're willing to work hard to become. Joseph woke up and did what the angel commanded. And took Mary as his wife. He says in verse 22, all this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message. Look, the virgin shall conceive a child. That's amazing. An impossibility in the natural, an improbability in every aspect. But our God is the master of taking the most improbable and the most impossible and miraculously turning it into something supernatural. You'll give him a name and it'll be Emmanuel. God is with us. Joseph woke up, verse 25, but he did not have sexual relationships with Mary until her son was born. Who? Her son was born. Because Joseph is not daddy. Oh, wait a minute. Have y'all noticed something? (sighs) I did it. And so have you. I'm going to start reading my Bible. It's the first of the year. I'm going to start in Matthew and read the whole New Testament. Let's start in verse 18. Because who cares about who beget, who beget, and who beget, and who beget, and who beget, and who beget. So we're just forgetting the who begettings. Do y'all ever do that? But you know what? In that genealogy that's written in the first 17 verses of Matthew chapter 1 and in Luke, you know what you're getting? The entire history of your genealogy as a child of Abraham and a son of God, a daughter of God, and an heir of Abraham. So they just say, so-and-so begets, so-and-so begets, so-and-so begets. So then we just tell you the Jesus story, and off we go. But see, the Bible says, study, be diligent to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the Word of God, because sometimes we live superficial Christian lives just looking for the diamonds on top of the surface When I have found, when I dig deep, the deeper I dig, the deeper I find it is. I want to be a student of the Word of God. Have you ever read scriptures and just skipped the genealogies, the begets? Oh, don't look at me in that tone of voice. See, Bruce says this, the Messiahship of Jesus depended on it being proved that he was a descendant of David. See, because I've told students you can be anything you want to be, but Jesus didn't just show up at the age of 10 or 12 there in the temple, forgotten and lost by his parents, and said, well, I've decided I'm going to be the Messiah. It's too late. If he's not conceived of the Holy Ghost in the womb of a virgin... No matter his great intention, he can't be Messiah and Savior of the world. If he's not born exactly where he was born, exactly how he was born, conceived exactly how he was conceived, it doesn't matter if he wants to be anything he wants to be. See, he has to be one of three things. He has to be a liar, a deceiver, someone who's a lunatic, who thinks he's Messiah, has a Messiah complex, or, my goodness, he's the Messiah. 
So we know how he's gotten here now. As we study scriptures, we know how he lived. So it's amazing to watch how one person supernaturally is fulfilling hundreds of scriptures and prophecies written over hundreds of years. If he fails to fulfill one prophetic scripture, he is disqualified. It doesn't matter his intent. It doesn't matter how much he desires to help his people. He's disqualified. See, in Mary, in Mama, the virgin, you see the blood lineage of Jesus. In Matthew, and that's recorded in Luke, but in Matthew's gospel, we see the legal lineage of Jesus coming through the lineage of Joseph. So let's just delve into that just a little bit. Look at the person beside you and say, we got 10 minutes. We're about to have a miracle here. Pastor's going to get done. But now watch this. As we follow this briefly, follow the lineage, when it comes to King David, from Abraham all the way to King David, there's a splitting of the genealogy. Jesus comes through the bloodline of Mary through David's son, Nathan. Let me just drop the bomb on you. If I'm correct, that would be the birth son of an illegitimate relationship with David and a lady that some of you have heard her name, Bathsheba, which demonstrates the grace of God who takes the most improbable and many of the difficult things of our life, and turns it for our good, demonstrating His grace to fallen humanity. But then on the other side, Satan attacks the blood lineage demonstrated here in Matthew of Joseph, which comes through Solomon. But why is it important? Because in the lineage here, we find there's the mention of this person in the lineage of Joseph, the adoptive father, the legal line, his name is Jehoiakim. And Jesus can't come through that bloodline. You say, why not? Oh, I heard you. Did you say that? Thank you for asking. Joseph's line went through Solomon and therefore through Jehoiakim, the cursed one in Jehoiakim, it is written in Jeremiah 36, 30, says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David. See, he was wicked. You read about that in the scriptures. It said he was a wicked king. And because of that, the prophet Jeremiah declares by inspired of the Holy Spirit, there will never anyone from his bloodline sit on the throne of David. That's why genealogy in Matthew is so important to study the history. But throughout the New Testament scriptures, we find that Jesus is referred to and on at least two different ways. One is the son of Abraham. The other is the son of David. We see him, the son of David, through David's son, Nathan, the bloodline of Mary. So let's just kind of check this out a little bit. The son of Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, many of us are familiar with us. We've studied the scriptures in the life of Abraham. It says, I will make you into a great nation, Genesis 12, 2. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth, all the families, not just the Jewish family, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you, Abraham. Jesus is referred to as the son of Abraham. Abraham. Those of us who have been born of Jesus Christ, our Messiah, our Savior, we are now that which was wild is now grafted into the natural olive branch, and we are the heirs of Abraham. Galatians chapter 3 said the curse was nailed to the tree that the blessing of Abraham can come upon us who believe. Oh, can I say it one more time? Suki suki. Look at the person beside you and say, oh, shama mama. I woke two people up. See, the promise of the blessing is on the son of Abraham. But the promise of dominion 
and ruling and reigning in life is upon the son of David. So let's look at the son of David. In 2 Samuel 7, 12, it says, speaking Nathan, speaking to his father David of a vision, it says, for when you die, you are buried with your ancestors, and I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. Gates of hell shall not prevail. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name. We, born again, are the temple of God. Come on, I'm going to preach up in this house. And I will secure his royal throne forever. I will be his father. He'll be my son. If he sins, obviously we're not talking about Jesus here. I will correct and discipline him with the rod like a father would do. But my favor will not be taken from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from your sight. Your house and your kingdom will continue to be for me for all time. <clears throat> and your, throat will be secure for, your throne will be secure forever. So Nathan went back to David and told him everything the Lord had said in the vision. God speaking to Nathan about the throne of David and ultimately the son of David. <clears throat> that is a position of dominion and ruling in God's kingdom. But you know, earlier, I mentioned that sometimes, even in the body of Christ, people who are born again, even spirit-filled, who are not built up and, and have a revelation of who they are in Christ Jesus and who Christ is that's in them, they feel insignificant, unusable. God can't possibly use me knowing my past. God can't possibly use me. I'm not tall enough. I'm not handsome enough. I don't articulate well. That's what Moses said. I, I'm just, I can't be used. Or I'm disqualified because as a young girl, I had an abortion. Or a failure. Or I fell in sin. Or I impregnated a young girl and I have a child or two that they don't even know I'm their daddy. I, I'm, I can't be used. You know, God is the God who takes that which was meant for our destruction. Even while we were being formed in our mother's womb, he counted our days and had a plan and a purpose. And Satan, just like he did against Solomon, tried everything he could to stop God. But I'm here to remind you today that our God is a mighty God. And if God said it, he is well able to bring it to pass.